What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, I speak with Elizabeth Economy, the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Economy is an acclaimed author and expert on Chinese domestic and foreign policy issues. She is the author of numerous books, the most recent of which is The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping and the New Chinese State, a wide-ranging exploration of the Chinese leaders' top political, economic, and foreign policy priorities and their implications for the rest of the world. Dr. Economy has published articles in foreign policy and scholarly journals, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and the Harvard Business Review, and op-eds in the New York Times and the Washington Post, among other newspapers and publications. Dr. Economy, welcome to Hidden Forces. Great to be here, Dimitri. How are you feeling? Feeling good. You've been on a media blitz. I have. It's been, it's been a good day. This is my fourth appearance. <laughs> so you were coming from MSNBC. That was a short walk from here, right? Yeah, That's very Rockefeller short. That's Rockefeller Center. About three blocks. What did you have before that today? I had a talk at the Lotus Club on the Upper East Side, oh. which was very nice. Sounds elegant. Uh, I've never been there. Well, you'll have to take you sometime <laughs> in an interview earlier on a foreign policy podcast. The Lotus Club, is that an Asian club or Chinese club? No. It's an, a long-standing club from the 1800s that's renowned for its sort of literary, cultural history membership. So it's it's a beautiful, beautiful you, old townhouse. Uh, you, you CFR swankies. It's the CFR swanky community. You guys have access to all the old school uh, institutions and clubs in New York. <laughs> uh, well, well, that's the only access that I got <laughs> going to give a talk. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm very excited to have you on. As you know, and I'll mention to the audience, Ann Stevenson Yang introduced us, who came on the show for episode 16 on the Chinese economy and banking system. And that was a great show. And she was a very popular guest. So I'm very excited to have you on. You come highly recommended. And on a wave of media, you've got your new book that's just come out. And uh, I've read it. And I'm very excited to review it here with you today. Could you give us some background about yourself, kind of where you came from, how you found your way studying Chinese, China, and sort of the foundation of your work? Sure. Actually, my original interest was in the Soviet Union. And I studied the Soviet Union, Soviet history, Russian literature. I actually studied in Leningrad back in the 1980s. Leningrad, when, Leningrad, those who don't when know, it was that's still Leningrad. Exactly, exactly. Now St. Petersburg. So I studied there. Then I did my master's work, also focusing on the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. I worked at the CIA for a couple of years in the mid 1980s as the Gorbachev analyst, which wow. was quite interesting. But then when I went off to get my PhD in the late 1980s, someone in the political science department professor said, you know what, you know a lot about the Soviet Union already. Why don't you think about studying China? Do some comparative communism. I thought that when sounded was, really interesting. Was this? this was 1987. Right. Very prescient. Yes. And so I began my study of the Chinese language and Chinese history. And I did comparative communism until, of course, the Soviet Union turned into Russia in the middle of my graduate work. Uh, so when I finished my dissertation, there was no more comparative communism. Comparative means comparing different types of communist countries like China versus Russia, for example? Right. Well, yeah, China or versus USSR. the Soviet Union. Right. By the time I finished. <laughs> Finished, though, there was no more Soviet Union. It was That's Russia. And it wasn't really communist. They'd had free and fair elections, and uh, it was a very different system. When did Condi Rice graduate and wor or finish her PhD? Well before I did, because she actually was my professor at Stanford really? when I got my master's. So, yes. What was she <laughs> yes. like? She's very smart. You know, she runs her seminars in a very structured way. She seems stern. I would she say could be stern. Stern is, is <laughs> fair. She's got a reasonably warm personality, but she always knows the answer. It's not a free-flowing discussion mm. where anybody can pop in with things. She's Soviet got the answer style. at the end of the day. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Learn by doing, as they say. Interesting. So the wall fell, and then you basically continued your studies focusing just on China? Well, so then it was time to get a job after I finished my PhD, and there were no Russia jobs because universities, uh, the U.S. government, it was a little bit less interested in Russia at that time than in China. Russia was a little bit on the, in the decline or seeming to be so. It was a much smaller place, right? It wasn't the Soviet Union with all those republics. Mm. But there were a couple of uh, China jobs at universities. And so I applied for one out at the University of Washington. And I started teaching. But then I got married, and I needed to move back to New York. And, and thus began my 
two-decade-odd stint at the Council on Foreign Relations as a China fellow and now director of Asia Studies. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, you know, I used to, when I had more time and it was more relevant to my work, because now so much of what we cover is in technology and the sciences, uh, I used to indulge heavily in CFR's podcast, which is basically just, you know, on the record conversations from the Council on Foreign Relations. I love that stuff. Great. Well, maybe we can get you up (laughs) to hang out sometimes. Sure. Yeah, why not? But before we continue, this is really interesting what you said about uh, working at the CIA in the 1980s as the Gorbachev specialist. What was that like and what did that entail? So mostly it entailed coming in early every morning and reading everything that he said and trying to put together a picture of who he was and what he was driving to do. So I started working there just a couple of months after he came into power. So there really wasn't a lot of knowledge about him at the time. So I was one of a few people at the agency who really focused all of our attention on him and began to develop a picture of of what Gorbachev was all about and where he was going to take the country. And there were a lot of fun things. I got to do a, a video for the Reagans on Raisa Gorbachev. It was a great time to be at the CIA working on the Soviet Union. Very interesting. So you have a portrait of Gorbachev that's very detailed, certainly by the standards of the average student of Russian history. Certainly I did, but of course it's classified, so I can't tell you anything about it. That's so cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's so cool. All right, so let's pivot then to China, to the Middle Kingdom, to the land of Asia. China, well, Asia at large has been in the news, obviously, because of North Korea. That's the been the big ticket item since the Trump took office. And I do want to talk about North Korea at some point because it is news related. Uh, we'll probably touch on it towards the end, get into it a bit. And I'd love to hear your take on China's relationship with North Korea and sort of maybe that foursome of North Korea, South Korea, China, and the United States and how that dynamic is working right now. But before we do that, I feel having read your book, I think you're in a unique position to inform me and our audience on giving us a larger picture of China, starting, I think, with its history and how China and the Chinese see themselves in relation to the rest of the world, couched within their sort of their dynastic history. How does the period before 1971, before Mao even, how does that inform China's policy today, both domestically and its foreign policy? Well, I think if you look back into imperial China and then the Republican era, which was right before the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, even when the Chinese people look back at that time, it's with a mixture of both pride in many of the accomplishments that ancient China accomplished, you know, as an innovator, paper, the compass, the printing press. They have a lot to be proud of, you know, China's its centrality in the global system. But at the same time, there's a sense of humiliation. And uh, they call, in fact, the period from 1849 to 1949 the Hundred Years of Humiliation. And that really refers to the fact that China during that period was often, for most of it in some respects, you know, either invaded by or occupied by uh, foreign powers. Uh, And so they didn't have control over their own territory. They'd gone from being this enormously proud empire to this decaying, not innovative, you know, behind the times in terms of in the Industrial Revolution country that could be occupied by other powers. So it's, it's a mixed legacy that the Chinese people feel when they look back. Is there a lot of lingering resentment felt towards the Japanese for that period in China, or is that overblown? No, there is a fair amount of resentment. And in fact, the Chinese government over the past few decades has done a lot to encourage that sense of resentment. You know, everything from television shows to video games tend to portray the Japanese in a very unfavorable light. You know, many times they are sort of set up as the enemy. And so much of what Japan has done for China, you know, over the 19, let's call it 1980s and into the 1990s in terms of assisting them with foreign direct investment or, or overseas development assistance, right? Japan has done a lot, for example, in the area of the environment to help China. None of that is really known to the Chinese people. So the Chinese government has very carefully crafted a narrative about Japan, I think, that continues to support a degree of resentment. Hmm, that's interesting. So you think it's mostly something that serves the governing members of China's elite 
that's a narrative that they push, but in the inner circles, it's not a type of resentment that they really feel, quite the contrary. Well, no, I think there's an element where it's quite self-serving, but of course there's an element of reality, too, in that the... Japanese haven't quite, you know, revised all their history books uh, to acknowledge the role mm, that they the played in World right, right. In World War II, for example, the Nanjing Massacre. So there's a sense that, yes, you know, Japanese leaders have apologized, but do they really feel it in the same way that, for example, the Germans have acknowledged mm. <laughs> their, their crimes against humanity? Yeah. You kind of touch on something when you were talking about that period that, uh, what would you call it, the, the period of shame? The hundred years of humiliation. Hundred, mm-hmm. hundred years of humiliation. I think that speaks partly, if not directly, to this notion of continuity and renewal. It seems, in reading your book and also in other things I've read over the years about China, there is a desire to sort of skip over that period and kind of cut and paste. I think similarly, you're Greek. We were talking about this before. There's a similar case, I think, with uh, Greece and its Ottoman history. There's a desire to sort of cut and paste that 400 years out. (laughs) Yeah, it's a long period. Right, yeah. (laughs) Snip it out. And I think uh, it seems, you know, just from an outsider's perspective, there seems to be something similar with China. And I think also there's this sense of, especially because it is such a powerful central bureaucracy, a sense in which they, you see this with countries also like in Dubai, an expanded sense of what the government can accomplish in terms of remaking history and remaking the future and forming the future, which sort of pervades all of this. And that kind of leads us to get deeper into the question of how the Chinese government works. I mean, what that even to call that a government, I think, is confusing. And that's something I've only learned as I've gotten into the subject more deeply. How does governance work in China? Hmm. I mean, there are entire books written about this, but let me try to parse it down. So I think the most important thing in terms of Chinese governance is really the Chinese Communist Party. And there are, you know, 89, 90 million members of the party. But it's not like joining the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. You can't just say, I'd like to be a Communist Party member. It's actually something that you have to earn. And the party recruits ostensibly the best and the brightest, certainly those who don't show any tendency to deviate in their thinking toward liberal Western ideals. They want those who are committed to the ideals of the Communist Party and who will be good implementers of whatever policy the you know senior officials decide to pursue. So you have these 90 million members of the Communist Party. On top of them sits the general secretary, who is Xi Jinping. He's the general secretary of the Communist Party. Under him, there are you know six other members of the standing committee of the Politburo. So they are kind of the seven most powerful people in the country. Then you have another 25, who 24 of whom are men, by the way. There's only one woman in the most senior leadership of China, and that's the Politburo. And then below them, you have the Central Committee, which is about... 200 some full members and another 197 you know alternate members and then finally you have the broader communist party this is really the group uh, the central committee on up that sets the broad policy for the country the broad directions you know are we going to have economic reform so if you look back during the time of Deng Xiaoping when economic reform was first announced it was during a party congress a plenum of a party congress 1979 exactly it comes through Deng Xiaoping's auspices as general secretary of the Mm -hmm. Communist Party. Then, you know, you look back under Xi Jinping and you see the same thing, right? His was during the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress in 2013. He announced a big program of economic reform. Of course, it hasn't come to pass, but the ideas were there in any case. So the party is responsible for setting the broad policy directions of the country. Then you actually have the state or the government And the government's really responsible for passing the laws and implementing policies. So the government is divided into two parts, really. You have the president, who again is Xi Jinping, and he sits on top of the National People's Congress, which is kind of a rubber stamp legislature, as well as uh, sort of is in charge of appointing the people to the state council, which oversees all the ministries, like the Ministry of the Environment Mm. or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So... These are two different parts of the state government. But the truth is that the party penetrates all of it. Mm. So the most senior people in the Communist Party also occupy the most senior positions Mm. in the government side. And this is matched all the way down. You have a provincial party secretary, a province being a little bit akin to a state. And you have a provincial governor who's the state side. But the provincial governor will also be a party member. 
So that's the way in which there's the party and the state, but really the party is the essence. It is the heart of the Chinese government. That's really interesting. So is it fair to say that the organs of state are sort of like the mechanical suit and the Communist Party is the animating spirit of the Chinese government? The ideology? It's the spirit, it's the brain, it's the body. <laughs> the, the mechanical suit part is really just the part that maybe executes things. The driving force is the Communist mm, the Party driving for force. the broad policy. Mm -hmm. So how does that factor into Xi Jinping thought? That was something I think that also Deng Xiaoping and Mao Zedong are the only other ones that had that? Well, yes, Deng Xiaoping had his thought, but the difference is that Xi Jinping, like Mao Zedong, was able to have his name and his thought enshrined in the Constitution, which was shocking to many people because Xi, Xi mm -hmm, because that elevated him in some respects above Deng Xiaoping. Wow. He earned something that only Mao Zedong had done before him. It was really one of the many signals we've had of the extraordinary amount of power that Xi Jinping has managed to amass in his own hands in just the first five years of his leadership. I don't think anybody would have anticipated that. Can you explain for our audience what that is when we talk about thought and then lead us into his biography, a little bit of sort of what we know about where he came from? Okay, so let me start with his biography and, and come to his thought. You know, Xi Jinping was born to privilege his father was one of the original revolutionaries, you know, at the same time as Mao Zedong. He was a leader in the propaganda effort. After the new government was formed, he was appointed as a vice premier, which is one of the most senior positions within the Chinese government. But then during the Cultural Revolution, right, which was this period of extraordinary tumult and chaos in the country when Mao Zedong essentially called for the broad masses to rise up against the bureaucratic elite and, you know, all the young children or, you know, teenagers of privileged families like Xi Jinping's family were sent down to the countryside. You know, Xi Jinping's family suffered a lot during this period. Xi Jinping, who is Xi Jinping's father, was put in jail. Xi Jinping himself what was sent down. These? So the Cultural Revolution was, you know, from the mid to late 1960s through the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. So Xi Jinping was sent down to the countryside for seven years. His sister was killed during the Cultural Revolution. You know, his own mother denounced him publicly. She had to, or she herself would wow. have suffered in some way. So a, a very challenging time in China's history that they actually have not fully acknowledged. But he was sent down to the countryside. And there he, you know, read a lot. He, you know, toiled with the villagers and was surprising about his time there was that being sent down, having all of this pain inflicted on his family, didn't turn him against the party. If anything, it made him more committed to the party. And so he reportedly applied 10 times to become a member of the Communist Party before he was finally accepted. Is that true or folklore, do you think? You know, it's been... It's a nice round number. <laughs> uh, I, it is a nice round number. I would say for sure it's multiple times, mm. but the number 10 has been said by many people. So 10 times until he was finally accepted, and then he went to Tsinghua University in 1975, before Tsinghua had reinstated examinations, though. So this was still a time when if you went to a university, you know, part of your training was in Marxism. You were trained as a, as a laborer, as a military person. It was a very practical kind of education, in addition mm -hmm. to sort of learning about engineering or whatever. You know, from that point, Xi Jinping, after he graduated, he, you know, took a job with one of his father's old secretaries and then began to move up the food chain of the party. And his rise was not terribly distinguished. He was known mostly for his stance on anti-corruption, which, of course, has been a hallmark of his first five years in office. He tended to lead in the coastal provinces, which were the you know wealthier, more successful, economic, rich areas of the country. That's just where he was placed. Mm. He didn't stall reform, but nobody ever talked about him as a great reformer. Mm. It wasn't until 2008 when he was selected to the Standing Committee of the Politburo that he really began to distinguish himself 
He was put in charge of the Olympics, which were, of course, a great success. He was put in charge of policy on the South China Sea in 2010, which has emerged as a pretty significant area in the past several years. He also was responsible for the party school, which was, well, which is the place where the party thinks about its new theories and its new directions, and it has its you know ideological debates. That's a very important stepping stone to uh, further leadership positions within the Communist Party. So it's at that time that you began to see you know Xi Jinping emerge. But even still, I would say when Xi Jinping in 2012 stepped onto the stage, the Great Hall of the People, having just been selected as the next general secretary, nobody would have anticipated the transformative impact that he would have on the Chinese political system or on its foreign policy. How is that? Can you explain, I guess, A, what was so transformative about it, and B, why was it so difficult to anticipate, or in retrospect, it wasn't anticipated? At least by foreigners, was it also? Do you think that the same applies to people in China as well? Absolutely, I think the same applies to people in China as well. I have spoken to many Chinese who worked around Xi Jinping, knew people who knew Xi. I think most people have been astonished at the direction in which he's taken the country. You know, to begin with, the ability that he's had to just amass enormous amounts of institutional power in his own hands. How does that work? Is that just by force of character? It must be. There are only seven people at the top. Remarkable. And, and he has been able to put himself at the top of all of the most important committees and commissions, whether it's cybersecurity or foreign policy or national security. He has, as we mentioned, been able to get his thought and his name enshrined in the Constitution in a way that only Mao Zedong had succeeded in doing before him. He managed to get, you know, the most recent example, he managed to get an amendment on the presidential term limits so that, you know, now there's no longer two terms for a president. He can be president for life, which means he holds the three most important positions, president, general secretary, and chairman of the Central Military Commission for as long as he wants or until the Chinese people decide that they don't want him. But really, it's been, I think, an astonishing feat that he has accomplished in just five short years. So in that sense, he's the most powerful leader of China since Mao? He's definitely the most powerful leader since Mao. I think some people might even say at some points more powerful than Mao because Mao at various points was still constrained by others around him. Now, having said that, I do want to make the point that it's difficult to know how much dissent and discontent there is in China. Well, so there's that. I mean, who are the kingmakers? I mean, he didn't obviously rise out of you know, out of thin air. Do we have any sense of who some of the powerful players are behind the scenes in China that enable the rise of people like this? Well, Deng Xiaoping was always the person behind the throne, the mm-hmm. kingmaker, as you put it. After he left his official role. As, as Exactly. And he was responsible for selecting every general secretary up until Xi Jinping. Mm. And Xi Jinping emerged as a kind of compromise candidate between Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. Mm. Even there, I don't think that either one of them expected the direction in which uh, Xi Jinping would take the country. In fact, there are a lot of discussion about the fact that the retired party elders like Hu and Jiang have complained bitterly about the extent of Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign. They didn't like the removal of the presidential term limits. They don't like a lot of what he's doing and the direction in which he's moving the country. So they picked him, but that doesn't mean that they're very happy with a lot of what he's been doing. Let's talk about the anti-corruption campaign because that'll get us into some of these other subgroups like the surveillance state and state-owned enterprises. Is it fair to even call it corruption? I mean, is that almost like a Western misnomer for what it is in China because it's so embedded? And is this really a populist a measure to win over public support? Or is it something that really is important for the functioning of the state and a requirement in order to root out this quote-unquote corruption? Yeah. You know, when Xi Jinping took power, one of the first things he said was that corruption could be the death of the Communist Party, even the death of the Chinese state, if it were not addressed, because it was so endemic. And it was at the highest levels and it was at the lowest levels, down to, you know, a parent in a village having to pay a teacher on the side so that, you know, his or her child could sit next to a heater. So at every level of society, you had corruption and graft. So Xi Jinping 
you know, started off his tenure with really corruption being the most important focus of his agenda. And he has, I think, done far more, again, than anybody might have anticipated. You know, typically, beginning with Mao Zedong in the early 1950s, anti-corruption campaigns, they've been a staple of Chinese political life. But they'd usually start, they'd go for about a year, maybe a year and a half, then they'd sort of slow down, people would forget about them, they'd come back a few years later. But Xi Jinping, you know, for five years, every year, more people have been detained, arrested, and prosecuted and put in jail than the year before. So the intensity of this anti-corruption campaign has not subsided. Not only that, but he's broadened the remit of the anti-corruption campaign to include not only party members, but also senior government officials who are not party members. So if you're the head of a school or a university or the head of a hospital or a manager in a factory and you're not a party member, a communist party member, you now can be investigated and arrested and detained for graft. Wow. It's part of this whole campaign. So this is a major element of Xi Jinping's agenda. It's real. Mm. You know, it reminds me in a way of what's been going on in Saudi Arabia. Is there a sense in which this anti-corruption campaign is also about solidifying his power? And he must have, obviously, his own set of alliances in order to be able to do that because he's going after well-connected, powerful people through this anti-corruption campaign. No doubt. And, you know, to run the anti-corruption campaign, he had for his first five years one of the most respected senior leaders in the government, Wang Qishan who's known to many Americans because he often played an important role in uh, bilateral negotiations with the United States during the Hu Jintao era. But no, Xi Jinping, I think, has also used the anti-corruption campaign to go after his political enemies. Mm. There's a good study done by a professor up at Harvard that demonstrated that slightly less than half of the senior officials, the vice ministerial level or above, who've been arrested for corruption are tied in some way to Xi Jinping's enemies. Hmm. So it serves a dual purpose. You know, on the one hand, there's a deep and abiding issue with corruption in China. On the other hand, he's able to consolidate his power and get rid of his political enemies. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stick on that consolidation of power for a moment because the anti-corruption campaign, obviously there is a component of that with respect to the elites in Chinese society. The surveillance state, the apparatus that controls, that censors the internet in China, something that we don't have here in the United States. Not, nothing comparable. Of course we have. We have NSA snooping and mass surveillance in the U.S., but nothing really comparable to what we have in China. I think this is fascinating. I mean, I know just a fraction of what the Chinese do, the lengths to which they go in order to control the internet, both through software and hardware. What can you tell us about surveillance and censorship in China and uh, the extent to which the internet is controlled and what is that like if you're living in China, you've never traveled abroad, what is the internet experience for you and how would that compare to what we have? So under Xi Jinping, the level of control over the internet and the development and expansion of the surveillance system has intensified many fold. This is a central element of his effort to centralize power, to control society, to eliminate opportunities for dissenting voices to be heard. So with regard to the internet, he has, as you suggest, a number of tools. There are technological tools, like the Great Firewall, which can just block an IP address outside the country, so the average Chinese cannot access the New York Times, for example. He has control over the Chinese internet companies. He can tell them which words he wants censored, and they can simply go after all those words and any message that's being sent across the Internet and just block that message from going anywhere. He also has censors who sort of screen what's on the Internet for content and look for things that they believe shouldn't be there. And then he has people who actually create content. So, you know, almost 500 million pieces of content on the Chinese Internet are created, are fabricated, you know, voices in debates and discussions to develop the narrative of the Chinese government by these, you know, 50 cent employees, many of whom are government employees. So it's a whole system by which Xi Jinping attempts to restrict the flow of information on the Internet. And of course, they're just punishments. You know, he has made it so that if you put a rumor out on the Internet and it's read, you know, it's passed along 5,000 times, that you could be detained, put in jail for a few years. He's really gone to extraordinary lengths to try to intimidate the Chinese people 
into not voicing opinions that would be considered sort of outside the you know domain of the party. Well, he's called it the battlefield for public opinion, right? Right, and it's so a very. I mean, that's telling right there. Yeah, it's, it's a war. It's a war. Against, a propaganda war. It's a propaganda war against what you know the Chinese media and he himself often call hostile foreign forces. Hmm. Right, these bad ideas that want to come in. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, that brings us to the question of values and ideology, which I think is what's most interesting here. But before we we move off this, you mentioned about the people that create content in China. How many people are engaged in that? Do we have any idea how many people are employed in the project of creating propaganda or controlling public opinion from the standpoint of content? Uh, several million. Mm. Uh, I've seen that number as well. Sure. Remarkable. Um, it is. It is. But, you know, they have 1.4 billion have, people, so yeah, they've they got have plenty of people. of people around to do that work. There's this, you know, I've seen news of a new social credit system that they're that they're rolling out. I mean, this is, you know, not to overstate things because... You know, I've never been to China. I don't want to act like I, I know what I'm talking about because I don't. Actually, let's be very clear. But it's almost like Black Mirror stuff. And that's a show that I've mentioned on the program often because I think it parallels real life in many places. And certainly this is just one more case. How does the social credit system work? Or it's being rolled out now, right? It's brand new, right? Right. It's being rolled out. And to date, it's for the most part, it's voluntary. But by 2020, there will be a government database and everybody will have a social credit, a number, a score. Uh, associated with them. And, you know, the scores are determined on a, by a range of factors, and that's part of what all the experimentation has been about, figuring out what those factors should be. But crazy. everything, yeah, everything that from, sounds crazy. Have you participated in a protest? Have you defaulted on a loan? There's even a report that is going to include how many hours of video games you're playing. So that's one part of it. That's ins- you know, that seems so insane. Yeah, some of it's technologically based. Some of it can be reports by your neighbors. If they see you doing something wrong, jaywalking, for example, the party at one point was saying they wanted the neighbors to report on people who were jaywalking, but most people said, you know, we're not going to do that. So, and then that leads to your score, leads to either opportunities or constraints. You know, opportunities, for example, to jump ahead of line in a restaurant, in a popular restaurant, or to send your children to more competitive schools. Constraints like not being able to board an airplane or a train if you've defaulted on a loan. It's a very punitive system for those people who have low credit scores. It seems to me that the opportunities for abuse are enormous. So this sounds, I mean, again, and I don't want to be alarmist because I don't know what I'm talking about, but when I hear this, it sounds so Orwellian that it's almost like a caricature of Orwell. Am I missing something or is it really that bad? And are they able to do that in a sense because it's to bring us back to values and sort of what the Chinese have been accustomed to for all these years? And if you're comparing today to 50 years ago, it's still better. And primarily because of that deal that they've made ever since Tiananmen for sort of giving up their political freedoms in return for economic growth. So I think certainly there is an element of Chinese history and and how the Chinese people have generally grown up within their society in which the government has always been much more intrusive in their lives than, you know, the U.S. government is in our lives. So from the time that they're born, beginning in school and going all the way through their work, there's always a dossier on their performance. People are always writing about how they're doing and what they're doing, and that carries with them wherever they go. So they know about that. You know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, they had these neighborhood committees. Old people would sit and report on what everybody was doing. You know, was somebody reading a book they shouldn't be reading? Was somebody pregnant with a second child that shouldn't be pregnant because there was a one-child policy? So there's always been this sense of reporting on each other, informing on each other. And that's one of the things, it's funny, I did some interviews on the social credit system for the book. And and one of the things I found surprising was the number of people who were okay with that. And they said, you know, look, we don't have a lot of trust between us. You know, the trust is really held within the family, within the confines of the family. But among just strangers on a street or even just some casual friends, there's not a lot of trust. And this will allow us a degree of trust. That's really interesting. And you know what? Maybe it's not so surprising because things have gotten way worse for freedom and privacy and agency of thought in the United States since 9-11. And we've gotten used to it. I mean, things were way different before that. I mean, anyone who had to board a plane back then or, you know, got on the Internet or whatever, things have changed so much. This notion of values is interesting, and it has a direct application in foreign policy, right? And uh, you actually have a quote in your book. I should find it here somewhere, but 
you say that for the first time, China is in a liberal state seeking leadership in a liberal world. Talk to me about what it means that China, in a liberal state, with the types of policies that we're talking about, is now exercising power on a regional and, in some places, global, like Africa, scale, with its bilateral relationships, at the same time as America is receding in certain areas. How does that uh, factor into what we're seeing in international relations, and how do you expect that to play out going forward as China perhaps becomes more powerful and as America begins to experience its own issues internally, politically, let's say, with populist elections, et cetera? So I think if you look back to 2014, Xi Jinping gave a speech in which he said that he wanted China not only to help write the rules of the game in the international system, but also to construct the playgrounds on which the games are being played. And I think it's a really good example of how he views his role and China's role in the world. And so we can see that play out in a number of ways. You know, first in his efforts to reclaim what he considers to be, you know, sovereignty, the parts of China that that don't belong to China right now. It's South China Sea and Taiwan and even Hong Kong, which is, you know, one country, two systems. He has worked very hard to begin to move from sort of staking claims, staking those sovereignty claims that have been around for so long, to actually realizing them. And most recently, just you know, in March of uh, 2018, at the National People's Congress, in his you know big speech, he said that the reunification of the motherland would occur, needed to occur by 2049. This could not you know, go on indefinitely. So he is now signaled... 2049. 2049. But he is now signaled that he expects... Again, why that date? So interesting. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's something that came up for me in our interview with Ayn Stevenson Yang, where she mentioned this, that nothing happens in China. I think my question had to do with what the Chinese people thought or wanted. And her point was really that what matters is the directives and that uh, when we're talking about economic growth, for example, what matters is the number that the government puts out, that that number is very, very important, that when the government says we're shooting for 7% economic growth, that's not just a projection or a hope. It's actually a directive. And so 2049, that's a signal to the rest of the government and people to sort of get the message. What message does that convey and for the operations of the state? And what does that mean that they're putting that hard number out there? Well, I think the message is as much for the Chinese people and the bureaucracy inside as it is for the people in Taiwan and the rest of the nations in Asia that have claims in the South China Sea that this is what we're planning to do. So get ready. This means that China is going to continue to invest in its military very heavily because it's going to want to reclaim more of the South China Sea. It's going to want to develop the capacity to take Taiwan over by force if necessary, that it will probably continue to ramp up the coercive efforts that it's already put in place with regard to Hong Kong and Taiwan to try to get uh, reunification moved along to erode the autonomy of both islands. So I think that's the signal that Xi Jinping is sending. It is a signal to the people at home, but it's also a signal to people outside the country. What did Trump do recently with respect to Taiwan that ruffled some feathers in China? So President Trump signed into law the Taiwan Travel Act, which for the first time made it possible for senior American officials to meet with their counterparts in Taiwan. Before this time, it really wasn't possible for senior officials on both sides to meet because Taiwan is not recognized as an independent state. We don't formally recognize Taiwan. We have a representative office there, and they have one here. But this really was transformative from the perspective of the Chinese. When I was in China at the end of March, the Chinese were upset about the impending tariffs uh, that President uh, Trump had announced. They were upset that uh, President Trump had announced he was going to be meeting with Kim Jong-un. They didn't seem to know about it. But more than anything, they were upset about the Taiwan Travel Act. Mm. And they said if the United States follows through on this, there are going to be serious repercussions. Why has that been such a sensitive point in diplomatic relations between the United States and China? Well, the reason that Taiwan is such a sensitive issue is because, you know, Taiwan maintains an extraordinary degree of autonomy from mainland China, even though the China says that Taiwan is a renegade province. Right. And they say it's renegade because it was a counter-revolutionary faction 
What was it? It was the original members of the dynasty was, that left? It wasn't members of the dynasty. It was Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> and right, so right up in the Chinese Civil War. Right. And they fled. The nationalists fled to Taiwan. Many mm. of them fled to Taiwan and established China. And we recognized Taiwan as China for you know several decades until we didn't. And we switched recognition, formal recognition, to the mainland China. But at the same time, we weren't prepared to completely throw Taiwan you know, over the ledge. And so we've maintained this relationship with them. We have the Taiwan Relations Act, which is a law in the United States that says that we will provide for the adequate defense of Taiwan. They're not an ally. It doesn't say that we will come to their defense if they are attacked, but it does say that we will basically sell them arms and ensure that they are able to defend themselves. No, we've been doing that for a long time. Exactly, yeah. for a very long time. But this Taiwan Travel Act takes the relationship up a notch, hmm. and it sort of points the United States-Taiwan relationship, gives it a formalized structure that it didn't have before, and further sort of makes fiction the idea that China likes to perpetuate that Taiwan and the mainland is just a matter of time and they're going to be reunified. Mm. Because the more that the United States and other countries recognize Taiwan as a separate entity, the less that China can really maintain that story. The Trump administration did something a bit more dramatic in the Middle East with the uh, recognition of Jerusalem as part of Israel. But that seems to have been more strategic, at least, or more long-running. Do you think that Israel and Netanyahu were not surprised by that announcement? Do you think this caught even the Taiwanese off guard? I'm sure that the Taiwanese leadership knew about it in advance. Certainly they knew it was being discussed in Congress. There's very popular sentiment with regard, you know, favorable sentiment with regard to Taiwan in the U.S. Congress. It's a small island, 21 million people. It's a democracy. And they're also very effective lobbyists. So they have a lot of allies in Congress. And compared to the big bag bully Mm -hmm. that's mainland China, uh, I think there is a desire uh, to offer a degree of protection from Beijing. This is a good probably opportunity to get into North Korea and uh, the recent news with North Korea because of the foreign policy issue. Of course, China has had a longstanding relationship with North Korea. It's not clear to me how tight that relationship is. I think in some sense the media has, I think, made it sound that the Chinese exercise a level of control or power over North Korea that maybe is exaggerated. What is that dynamic like? North Korea, China, now South Korea, and uh, the United States. So it's a, a very complicated kind of dance where each of the four members of the Quad have different relationships with each of the others. I mean, China and North Korea have had a close relationship for many decades. But interestingly, when Kim Jong-un, who's now in power in North Korea, came to power, he and Xi Jinping, they never met. You know, So for the first five years of Xi Jinping's tenure, he did not meet with the leader of North Korea. That was unprecedented. Mm. They had a, a rocky relationship. You know, Xi Jinping didn't appreciate Kim Jong-un's testing of the missiles. I didn't con- appreciate the continued development of North Korea's, you know, nuclear capabilities, and certainly didn't appreciate it when Kim Jong Un had his uncle assassinated and his uncle mm-hmm. or executed, who was the closest partner of China. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have any relationship, and it wasn't until President Trump announced that he was going to be meeting with uh, Kim Jong Un that, in fact, President Xi met with President Kim, because it would have been really... Um, well, that caught the Chinese government off guard as well, right? Uh, it I did. mean, if there's one thing the Trump administration has done is they've really shaken things up. They have definitely shaken things up. And frankly speaking, I think it's not a bad thing when it comes to China, because they've certainly gotten used to the United States talking and talking and, and not doing much of anything. So certainly President Trump has been the fly in the ointment. The real question is whether there's a, a path forward or whether he's all about the shock value. Right. Well, there's been a lack of reciprocity in this relationship, right, for a long period of time between the Chinese and the United States. I think when you look at the economic relationship, certainly. I think the United States has operated for decades since the opening up in the early 1980s under the assumption that as China developed economically, it would begin to look more and more like the United States. It would uphold the liberal international trade rules that if the United States modeled best behavior, China would gradually Mm -hmm. accommodate to that. So sooner rather than later, it would begin to protect intellectual property. Well, 30 years later, and IP theft, intellectual property theft, is still an enormous problem. Mm 
in the U.S.-China relationship. So I think the Trump administration you know, walked in the door and said, we have all of these outstanding problems with the Chinese. They've made all these promises with regard to you know, market opening and intellectual property, and we don't see any of it. And so that, I think, precipitated the kind of tough actions that we've seen over the past several months. How much do you think that was part of a large strategic vision by the U.S. foreign policy establishment, that idea of opening up China and leading by example with our values, right? And how much was it really about money and access to cheap labor and the lobbying of U.S. corporations and manufacturing? I mean, I think the two went hand in hand, and there's no denying that the opportunity to sell to, you know, 1.4 billion people in China is an attractive, if often elusive one, uh, not just for American companies, but for multinationals around the world. But that opportunity, you know, came at a time as well when you had a sense that China was opening up. It wasn't just about the market. It was about Chinese civil society. It was about the flowering of non-governmental organizations and and the advent of the internet. And so there was a, a sense that China as a whole was opening up and was beginning to develop uh, some of the attributes potentially or moving along the path toward a more open and democratic society. You know, one of the things that got a lot of play leading up to 2008 and I think during sort of the years, intervening years after that, is the U.S. Treasury bond holdings of the Chinese government. That's something that we don't really hear much about anymore. Is that something that gets any play in China? Do the Chinese even sort of see that as a strategic holding anymore? It just doesn't seem to be as important as it was. No, I think that economists on both sides have, for the most part, put the idea that you know China is the U.S.'s banker and therefore holds an enormous amount of leverage over the United States. They've put that idea to bed. Because, of course, if China began a rapid sell-off of its treasury holdings, the price would fall and it, too, would suffer. Right. So it's, it's not in China's interest either. Well, uh, that brings us to the yuan, right? Because so much of what Chinese policy has to do with with respect to U.S. treasury holdings has to do with its uh, currency. And its currency, of course, is central to the health of its export sector. And there's, of course, not to make it sound like that the only thing supporting the yuan is the purchase of U.S. Treasury is quite the opposite. In fact, they have a lot of malinvestment in that economy. I guess that brings us to a larger question of the economic health of China. What is your take on the state of that economy? How much of that is smoke and mirrors, and how much of it is real growth that will be sustained? And and if it isn't, what does that fallout look like? Because that's a real possibility. You know, that's the trillion dollar question, of course. Yeah, multi-trillion. And, and, you know, exactly. And frankly, I've never really gotten a good answer from any China economist about the reality of the Chinese economy. You know, it's like Tesla. Growing at, growing at 6.9%, ah, no, not really, growing at about 4%. And I, you know, what can we see? You know, rapidly rising debt, right? So debt in the corporate sector, government debt, and now even household debt. And you can look, the IMF you know, has a report that says when you experience this kind of very rapid rise in debt, that that often precipitates a financial crisis. So that's one marker out there. Xi Jinping has tried since the beginning of this year to begin to deleverage the economy, but he's also trying to address poverty alleviation, and he wants to fight on the environment, and he wants to ensure that the economy continues to grow at a rate that allows him to double incomes between 2010 and 2020, because that's another one of those numbers out yeah. there that he set. So, you know, how does that all balance? I think we've seen over the past five years, indeed over the past 30 years, that whenever the Chinese economy seems to be sputtering, they just turn on the stimulus and, you know, credit flows. So I think it's unclear to me the sort of the real strength of the Chinese economy. They're pouring money into research and development, into innovation. Much of that is wasted, but some of it's going to work and some of it's going to pay off. You know, Belt and Road, similarly, this grand scale project mm. for infrastructure connectivity that, you know, China is commanding 89% of all of the infrastructure projects. They're all being done by Chinese companies, but a lot of them are money losing. Mm. You know, how do we understand all of that? It's very complicated. Mm. I think the best we can do is sort of begin to look at each part of it and try to understand what is the reality on the ground and then how does it all fit together. So, what does that mean for us or for American corporations? We have a more liberal democratic order 
here, in, not just in the United States, but in Europe. We hold our government to some level of accountability. It's not perfect, but it's certainly better than what they have in China. But the way in which the Chinese economy and government is organized allows its corporations to project power internationally in ways that American corporations can't. And that puts our corporations and us at a disadvantage. But at the same time, in order to right that wrong, we would have to give up the types of freedoms and rights that we value. So, you know, there's this tension with the rise, as you say, of an illiberal state in a liberal world. Because ultimately, this isn't really about America versus China. This is about you and me and my engineer here and those of us who live in this country who live under this constitution. And the international forces, the liberal forces that we're talking about today and others that challenge that, whether it's North Korea with its nuclear missiles or China or Russia. How does that balance itself in the context of China? Look, I think for the United States, it has to be a two-pronged fight. You know, on the one hand, we have to push back against practices, whether on the political front, for example, you know, China's desire to export its autocracy and to change sort of the charter of the, you know, human rights in the United Nations. You know, we need to push back against that. We need to work with our allies to do that. On the other hand, we have to strengthen ourselves at home. We don't like Made in China 2025, China's industrial policy. Let's take them to the World Trade Organization. But at the same time, let's you know, invest more in our own research and development. You know, a number of the major discoveries in American history, you know, scientific breakthroughs came, at least in part, with the support of government funding. We shouldn't be afraid to use our government to help drive innovation. So I think, you know, there's both a, a strengthening of our own values that we need to articulate and to advance to combat what China's trying to do on the global stage. By the same token, we might be able to learn a little something from the way that they do business as well without compromising ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting, though, hearing you talk about that. To me, there's a real tension. The things that get a lot of play in the media are like this Thucydides strap, this idea, for example, that the rising China and a declining America will somehow at some point intersect and, and go to war. There's North Korea. We talk about that. There's the malinvestment, et cetera. But this tension, this clash between centralized systems and decentralized systems is something I don't think is appreciated enough. Culturally, there's a certain section of society in the West, particularly in the United States, with some of the technologies that we've covered on the show, like blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. And we covered this also, I should say, recently with Africa and the push to sort of take advantage of the lack of institutions in Africa with these technologies that allow for people to organize and uh, develop societies and economies in new ways. There's this tension between that decentralized culture of organization globally and these old legacy institutions, countries, et cetera. And China, I feel like, is the prime example because they have such a strong top-down bureaucracy. That, to me, even more so than the classic institutions of the United States, its military and the Chinese, for example, this clashing, this Thucydides trap, I think that is the one that's more difficult to resolve. I wonder what you think about that. I think it's an interesting way to posit it. The one thing that maybe it misses is the sense that even within China, there is decentralization in the sense that you have a very active Chinese society. You know, innovation occurs now in China not only through state-owned enterprises, which in fact are not very innovative, uh, but not only through government-directed research, but, you know, just in garages and in apartments and in universities, just like it does here. And those people want access to information outside the country. You have civil society, you have a massive feminist movement developing in China today. You have LGBT rights activists, you have environmental activists. So, you know, it's not all about the top-down nature of the Chinese government. We never want to forget that there's an enormous amount of bottom-up pressure within China as well. Well, that's a great point. But for example, you know, we talked about the firewall. They've been shutting down the VPNs, right? The Chinese government. So there is, you're right, this bottom-up pressure. But the question is, is the government in China prepared to accept an empowerment of the bottom? It's not clear to me from our conversation today or anything I've read that they are. And I think, if anything, that perhaps could complement what I'm saying before, which is that that same pressure can create problems and instability within China, in particular when they've wasted so much money 
They've created so much malinvestment because of their top-down programs and their state-directed investments that are meant to achieve some large-scale national foreign policy objective. That, to me, is also part of the same risk. And I think, in a sense, all of us who have liberal values are at risk of this pressure to centralize from the top from some of these institutions, including the United States. I mean, in order to combat terrorism, for example, the U.S. took away privacy and freedom of American citizens. What would happen, for example, if China becomes more and more powerful and their values, as you've written in the book, become part of the equation, part of the the offering, right? Well, and that's exactly why I say we need to push back against Mm. that happening, uh, that we need to understand our own strength and also to recognize this isn't simply a battle between the United States and China. You know, most of the powerful economies, most of the great economies of the world, with the exception of China, are liberal democracies. And so it's really not just, you know, China versus the United States. And I think that's in part where Graham Allison and the Citizens' mm. Trap, where he gets it wrong, is that, you know, we have India, right? The largest democracy in the world. There's Japan, there's the EU, there's Australia. And all of these actors together, and many more, frankly, pitch in, right, and push back in different ways. Mm. So even, for example, you know, one very small example, when China wanted Huawei to lay the fiber optic cable from Solomon Islands to Australia, Australia said, no way. We're not having this Chinese company Mm. and Chinese government involved in this. You know, we'll take care of it ourselves. You know, so people tend to cast everything in sort of a U.S.-China bilateral conflict, but that's not the way the world works. And when you look at what's going on in Asia, you begin to see that there are many powerful regional actors that are also willing to stand up to China and push back. Hmm. Dr. Economy, we, there was so much I think we covered. I hope we did it justice. There were some things that I wanted to touch on, but you know, I had to do my best to thread the needle here. I appreciate you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dimitri. And that was my episode with Elizabeth Economy. I want to thank Dr. Economy for being on the program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stiliano de Colau. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.